Let's continue on. Let's look at this function. 1 over x minus 1, and g of x is 1 over x plus 1. So let's compute that on your own. Assuming you have done that, remember g is the first function. So g of 2, so 1 over what? 2, and then a plus 1. That would be g of 2. Then you're putting this whole thing into the f function. So you have 1 half plus 1 is going to go into the x. So it be 1 half plus 1 and then minus 1. So when you simplify that, look, this plus 1 got undone with the negative 1, and 1 over 1 half is going to get undone, and you're going to get a 2. We started with 2 and ended with 2. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? You can see what is happening here. So we took 2 and put it into g. It got changed. Then we put that changed quantity into the f function, and it almost looks like it unraveled f function unraveled what g did to 2 and spit 2 out again. So whatever happens to 2 when it ran into g, f undid everything, all the changes, and made it how it was before we started. Why don't you verify if that happens with all numbers? So if I put 3, 4, 5, any number, you can see any number plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, go away, 1 over that number basically, which was the reciprocal, will give you the original number back. All right, let's take a look at g composite f of 3 and see what happens. You go ahead and do that. All right, so we have 3 goes into f. So it'll be 1 over 3 minus 1, or 1 half, right? And then you put that into the g function, so it'll be what then? Go ahead and finish it off. So put that into g. So it'll be 1, g of 1 half would be what? 1 over 1 half plus 1, which will give us 3. Oh, wait a minute. Look what happens. So we got 3 back again. So it looks like whatever f did to 3, g undid f. So this is interesting. So it is possible that sometimes you encounter functions that undo each other. Let's see if it really happens all the time. So that means we'll have to look at f composite g of x. So let's see if that happens all the time. So compute it, go ahead. Yep, x goes into g. That will give you 1 over x plus 1. And then you're going to put that whole thing into the f function. So you're going to take 1 over x plus 1, put it into the f function, which is going to give you 1 over that whole thing, which we saw before that the plus 1 is going to get undone by negative 1, and then 1 over 1 over x will get undone and make it an x. So it looks like for this function, yes, f really does undo g of x for all x in the domain of g. Remember, it has to be in the domain of g. Domain of g is what numbers? 1 over x. x can never be 0 then. So for all non-zero x, it looks like this function undoes it. Now, if x is not 0, then 1 over some non-zero number plus 1 is also never going to be 1. And so it, all of these values can go in here and make sense. So you can see that this is a valid operation for all x's that are in the domain of g. All right, let's take a look at the other one, g composite f of x, and see what happens there. So you're starting with the f function, and you're putting it into the g function. So f of x, which would be 1 over x minus 1, right? And then you're going to use the g function and see what happens. And we know that this is going to be the reciprocal of 1 over x minus 1, so x minus 1 plus 1. So you can actually see how it gets undone. And so g composite f of x would also be x then. Well, let's look at the domain. We already saw a domain of the original function f is all real numbers not equal to 1. 
because otherwise you'll have zero on the denominator. So negative infinity to one, one to infinity. Let's take a look at domain of g. Cannot have zero on the bottom, so negative infinity to zero, zero to infinity. What about range? Range of this function. It's always one over something, so you're never going to get zero. And range of g will be everything one and up, or one and down. You can never have one. And uh-oh, look what happened here. Does anyone notice something? Look very carefully at your screen and see if you notice something. Very interesting. I even color coded it so that it would jump out at you. Look at that. Domain of f is range of g. And domain of g is range of f. So these functions that undo each other have a special name. Remember, I kind of hinted at what we were going after at the beginning. It's inverse functions. So f and g are called inverse functions of each other. So input of one becomes the output of the other. So input of f function becomes output of g function. And that is why domain of f is also the range of g. And domain of g is the range of f. So if x, y is a coordinate on the graph of f, then y, x would be coordinate on its inverse function. We're going to use that information to study inverse functions. So what is an inverse function? Let's um, see if we can write that out. So an inverse of a one-to-one -one function, this is why we need it to be one-to-one, -one because that way we can guarantee that when you do the reverse relation, it still remains a function. And the notation for inverse is f negative 1 as an exponent of x. But this negative 1 is not an exponent. It is just the name of the function. We read that as f inverse of x. It is different from being 1 over f of x. That is completely different. That would be f of x, the whole thing, to the power of negative 1. So just remember, this is a notation, a name of a function. Inverse function of f, that's what this is. So it's a new function that undoes what the original function f of x does to the input. So if you had y equals f of x, where x is the input for f function, y is the output for f function, then y becomes the input for the inverse function, and x becomes the output for the inverse function. This is very important because when we study some particular functions, this relation is going to come in handy for you. So y equals f of x is the same as saying f inverse of y equals x. And then if you wanted to sketch the graph, then what? You take the original function f of x and all the coordinates a comma b, where b is f of a, will become b comma a. And that's how you graph it. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say here is my function f of x. If I want f inverse of x, what would I have to do? I would have to plot coordinates. So let's plot coordinates. So instead of well, 0, 0, if you switch that, it will become 0, 0. So 0, 0 will remain. But the coordinate 1, 2 will become 2, 1. So let's plot that. The coordinate 3, 4 will become 4, 3. And plot that. Right? OK, so we have the coordinates. So we can sort of see this is how the graph would look. All right, so let's go ahead and graph that. So you can see how here are the coordinates that we just plotted. And then this will be the graph of the inverse function right here. You can see, which means to, if you have a graph, you can simply reflect it across the line y equals x. Because if you have 0, 0, 1, 1, whatever, those coordinates, when you switch x and y coordinates, will remain. So all points that are on x equals y will remain. All the other ones get switched. So 1, 2 becomes 2, 1. 3, 4 becomes 4, 3. So this will be the graph of the inverse function. So let's go back and characterize that here then. So if you have a function here, then that will be our inverse function. So you can see how if the original function was f of x, 
then inverse function is going to be f inverse of x. It's a reflection across the line y equals x. If a, b is a coordinate on f of x, then b, a is a coordinate on f inverse x. So what about domain and range then? Domain of f inverse is range of f of x, and range of f inverse is domain of f of x. Sometimes this comes in handy because it's easier to find domain for most functions and harder to find the range of the functions. So again, if you take f composite f inverse of x, you end up with x, and f inverse composite f of x also x, because they both undo each other.